Hello there, welcome back to The Closet Historian and back to my sewing room. Today I have another 1920s themed project for you all. I do have a video here on the channel going over the 1920s one hour dress and like all the details associated with that in a long rambly video that is actually longer than an hour, which is, you know, the name of the dress is one hour dress, but the video I made on that dress is even longer than an hour. In any case, I'll put a card up to that here for those of you who haven't seen that video. It's actually the most successful video on my channel so far, even though many have reviewed it as very confusing, which some say it's helpful, some say it's confusing, perhaps it falls somewhere in between, and that's what I'm hoping this next 1920s video will be as well, somewhere between confusing and helpful. Let's hope. Some of you may have seen this new 20s dress of mine that I featured in my Ravenclaw lookbook recently, very recently, um, and I wanted to show you all how I went from my one hour dress pattern to this one, which is of course sleeveless, has a v neckline, and then the handkerchief hem. So I wanted to show you how using the principles from behind the one hour dress pattern, I made this pattern instead, and ended up making this dress. So we have a lot to get through, so let's jump on over to the blue patterning table of doom and get started. Here on the blue patterning table of doom, we begin with the 1920s one hour dress pattern. Now I've already made a very long rambling video all about this pattern, so I will, again, it'll be in the card up here if you would like to listen to me explain at length the one hour dress pattern. But that is what I will be using as a basis to start off with today. So that's what this guy looks like. Looks like this. This is what the pattern looks like laid out flat. You just have a front and a back that is identical. They are identical, I should say. And then in the side I showed in that first video either how to gather the like hip flare into gathering or into a box pleat along the side there. And for my 1920s one hour dress, for me personally, from the top of my shoulder to where I want the drop waist to be, so kind of like the top of my hip where I decided I like my drop waist to hit, is 22 inches. Across the main body of my one hour dress pattern, it is 22.5 inches, and that is because my bust measurement is 42, plus I added about three inches of ease because if anything you want your 1920s garments to turn out a little bit baggy, because that was the look of the time, um, better they be a little bit extra loose than too small or tight. So my bust measurement plus three inches equals 45 and then half of that is 22.5 naturally. So that is what the main width of my one hour dress pattern is. Now in, within that 22 inches of the like bodice length of this pattern, my sleeve, you know, it's all in one sleeve here. It kind of drops into a kimono-ish sleeve, but it's all in, you know, there's no uh, shoulder seam. But my sleeve comes down 11 and a half inches when I measure my pattern. I think that's about an inch lower than I said in my video. For whatever reason it grew, I guess I must have added an inch on at some point. So um, my sleeves come down 11 and a half inches into that 22 main bodice-ness. So basically the main like section up here is 22 by 22 and a half, however. So what I've done is I have drawn a big square, essentially, that is 22 and a half this way and 22 long. Um, and we'll get to that in a second. I just want to show you like the uh, basic, you know, rectangle or square that is inside this one hour dress pattern that I will be using today. Now, of course, I'm not making a one hour dress today. I'm making this dress today. So this is a modification using the principles learned in making a one hour dress or the same principles used to make such thing and applying it to this dress instead. So, of course, we have lost our sleeve here, you'll notice. So we lost our little sleeve extensions, and then I've added a waist seam so I could do a different shape of skirt on this one. Um, although you could easily do the same shape of skirt all in one like this if you had a really wide fabric. But as I do not necessarily have a super wide fabric, I'll be adding a waist seam just across this drop waist here. Add on half inch to the bodice section, half inch along the top edge of the skirt section to of course have seam allowance so we can sew the two together. So I'll add a waist seam on, remove the sleeves, add a V neckline in the front here. So I will have to cut my front and back separately because the back will have um, a straight, like slightly dipped back across neckline and the front will have this V. And then the skirt shape on this is similar to a circle skirt in the sense that it's all cut in one big square. So instead of having a big circle, which is what, you know, what this kind of would look like if you just imagine this as being a circle instead that's what a circle skirt is. Instead of adding a circle onto this bodice, I'm going to add a square. That way it has these little dangling handkerchief points here. You can see examples of skirts like this from the 1920s. Mostly seems to be the latter half of the 1920s and into the 30s with these handkerchief hems. Um, usually it seems to be what's happened for most of the dresses I can see in excellent examples is that they've layered 
one square that's set straight on like this and one that is set with the points. So if you imagine this is the waist here in the center. If you center that within the square like this and then you angle at a 45, another piece like this under or above it, you end up with the skirt kind of like this one. Um, but you can just do one or the other and I'm gonna be using just adding a skirt that is a rectangle onto the bodice here is what I'll be doing today. But you could also do it with the points hanging in the front. Um, if you do the points hanging in the front, you'll have them on the front and the sides as well. Um, but this, I just wanted a straighter across front and back and then two points on the sides. Or, well, you'll see. Um, another way to variate this um, or add variation to this look and make it even more uneven and handkerchiefy is to have the point where the waist meets this square offset. So put it closer to this front point and then it'll be longer in the back and then shorter in the front. Um, you could also put it off to the side and then you'll have shorter on the side and front and then longer on one side in the back. So you can put your waist in different spots on um, a square or a rectangle to get different kinds of handkerchief hems going on. But in general, going from the one hour dress pattern, which looks like this, to a pattern that looks much more like this with a kind of strap and a waist seam um, and like a bit more of an arm side and then a longer extension that will then fall into these handkerchief hem situation. So this is the dress I want to make today. But alas, were, would, were that it were so simple, for those of you who have seen Hail Caesar, would that it were so simple? Because we run into a problem immediately, or at least if you're anything like me and you have a D or a double D or more situation happening, you run into a problem over here in the bust. Because as soon as you, like in, in all an ideal world, you know, to get to here, we would come over here onto our one hour dress pattern. We would slice off the sleeve extensions. We would add a V, pop that thing on over your head. And suddenly this whole area doesn't fit like it used to. When doing a one hour dress, this kind of just falls into folds here that are part of the kimono all set in one sleeve, um, all on one sleeve. Um, the folds that occur for that are like supposed to be there and so it seems natural and is fine. But once you remove these sleeves, the lack of darts in a bodice like this start to show themselves. Now you will notice on many 1920s dresses and in literature covering 1920s dresses, no darts are mentioned. In fact, it's more that they talk about how there aren't any um, and that you would not use them. But today I have a revelation to share with you all. And that is that A, boobs exist. And uh, even if the 1920s don't think so, we have to do something about it. Now, I'm not about to strap into one of these contraption corset things, uh, flattening situations. Uh, I don't wear 1920s religiously. I don't, I'm not a reenactor. I'm not interested in uh, the amount of, I don't know, uh, complications in acquiring such a garment or making such a garment, or perhaps even the discomfort in wearing one. Not sure, maybe they were quite comfortable, I don't know. Um, but I'm not going to wear a full boob flattening girdle situation. In fact, I'm not even really willing to uh, wear a sports bra, which I will be showing you the difference with that today. Um, but that's just not really my jam. I'm not a reenactor. I just like 1920s fashion, but I'm not willing to like go all the way. I'm sorry. Um, I know some of you maybe, and maybe you are doing a 1920s play or going to a party and you want to do the whole accurate thing, in which case we'll, uh, I'll cover, you know, drafting this pattern today with wearing a sports bra or some sort of flattening, uh, more flattening undergarment as opposed to just wearing a regular bra. I will be just wearing a modern kind of soft cup lace bra um, when I'm planning on wearing with this dress and what I will be planning to draft with today. But in general, even though if the 1920s doesn't want to acknowledge it, boobs did exist, even then. So what did ladies do without bust darts? Now we know if we look at, you know, say, this is the 1940s dress on the other side here, it has darts in the waist or gathering where they're like, cause darts, you can either, if you have a dart, you can sew that shut or you can just pretend this is gathering instead and gather this down. Um, so like bust darts are a way to add and take away fullness. Um, and so are gathers in some ways. So I was like trying to fit this pattern on me yesterday because I was like, I try and do some pre-planning before I start trying to give instructions on how to do something. I try and remember, see if I even remember how to do it. And I haven't made a dress quite like this before. So I was discovering things as I went 
through trying to do things for this video. So what I did is I drafted this how I thought I should from the one hour dress pattern and I immediately ran into the problem of this like area gaping and I'll show you this in a moment. And I wanted to know what I could do to fix this without having lots of darts because it just wasn't common in the 1920s and I was like how did they how did they do this because obviously they figured out a way. They weren't they didn't just you know tell all large busted women to stay home in the 20s. Uh, <laughs> their solutions had to be found. So I actually found a blog um, where they re this person who runs this blog seems to repost um, pages and images and text from delineator magazines from the 1920s in which they have an article covering um, what if you need a second bus start which wow thank you because it's talking about how to pin in a second bus start if needed which means obviously you were allowed to have at least one so uh, I really I will link to this blog post in the description below it's from I think 1927 the page said so as far as Butterick, who is, I believe, who ran Delineator Magazine is concerned, they said that you could have a bus start in 1927. So I'm going to have one. Um, they said you could have two if you needed another one. So I will link that blog post below um, as some sort of like primary evidence for having bus starts on a dress like this one. But I also was doing research yesterday and looking at a lot of 1920s garments and fashion illustrations, trying to find evidence of darts in 1920s fashion as a general rule, because I need them for it to lie smooth, but I don't want to feel like I'm doing something completely inaccurate, even though I was just talking about how I'm not a reenactor and I don't really care. Some part of me obviously cares, and I want to do some diligence to see if I am completely off base having a bust dart in a 1920s garment. So I went on the hunt for them, and let me tell you, I found a couple of darts, dun dun dun, like this one. What are you doing there? What is that? It looks like a dart to me. Um, as we know here on this channel, because we're already always swinging uh, darts around, from the apex. If you have, let's say, a waist dart and a bust dart, you can swing one of them up into the shoulder just like this image shows a shoulder dart here. At least that's what it looks like to me. Um, you can argue with me if you should so desire. Why not? I might ignore you, however. Um, so clearly this image shows a shoulder dart and the delineator says we're allowed to have darts. And a lot of uh, 1920s slip patterns, um, like underdress patterns, seem to show bust darts coming in under the arm here. So clearly, you know, it was something that people were aware of and did use. However, I also think that they were just sneaking them. So today I'm going to talk about... Where'd it go? The 1920s secret dart. That's right. The 1920s. They were sneaking darts in without us knowing. So yeah, there's not darts from the waist. There's not darts from the side. Maybe they don't have an underarm dart like the slips do. But they do have like maybe pleats, like this dress example, in the shoulder, or more common than never, gathering along the shoulder here. Now you're thinking, yes, that's just a style choice, Esposito. Like you can just add gathering for the look of it. Well, let me tell you something. If you have a dart like this and you swing, if you close this dart and you swing the fullness up into the shoulder and then control it with gathering, that looks exactly the same. So I'm convinced that the 1920s was secretly including extra fullness for the bust in these sort of details. So if you ever see dresses like these that I went trolling for on Pinterest last night that have this kind of detailing up the shoulder, I think they're hiding bust fullness in there so that this whole area fits better on ladies who just happen, you know, or people who happen to have a chest, um, you know, because uh, sometimes people's got boobs and you have to fit for it, okay? I'm sorry, 20s. If you are like a small B cup and an A cup and you can just wear very flat fashions, good for you. This is the era for you. But for people like me who are shaped in a more 1950s way, uh, you know, you got to hide that waist and control fullness around the bust somehow. So this has been a very long intro just because I was, you know, trying to do this yesterday and trying to film it for you. And then I realized instantly that I needed to go back into the primary source material back into a little bit more research and figure out exactly how to achieve this design with my body shape and also 1920s general design aesthetics. So with that all said, let me go ahead and show you how I take these measurements and got to here. So again, I have drawn a rectangle, technically square almost because it's only a half inch difference, 22 inches tall and 22 and a half inches wide, just like my 1920s one hour dress pattern. This is the basis that I started from. Now on my 1920s one hour dress, um, those of you who've seen that video 
or I'll just go over it a little bit now. Uh, this all-in-one sleeve here on this pattern, obviously see I added on an inch here. So my sleeves are 11 inches wide here. And I'll have to add seam allowance because I haven't done that, but we'll do that in, in a minute. Um, on here I have indicated four inches in from the like sort of main body shoulder point. That's how far in I sew the front and the back together and then I leave the rest of the neckline open. If you imagine this is the center front or center back because this pattern is identical on either side. But that's how far I sew in. So I did go ahead and mark on here how far in that was as well just so I knew kind of where my shoulder began for drawing in necklines and things on this version. So just referencing my other 1920s dress pattern um, here again that I drafted in a very long video here on the channel. But over here, I just wanted to start figuring out where exactly I wanted everything to be. So first things first for the, if you imagine this is the main 22 and a half line here. So the sleeve extensions, this part here would normally be here, but I have not included them here at all. But I'm gonna mark 11 inches down, just like how the sleeve comes down 11 inches. I'm gonna mark here on this pattern as well, because that's where I'm gonna have my sleeve, or my lack of sleeve, my sleeveless arm side go on here. Now this looks very different from the arm side on say, my regular bodice block. My regular bodice block, if you imagine this is the shoulder seam, it curves way a ton more, and that's because this has some serious darts going on. Um, and it's just like a much more, less easy, curve. It's much more like, whew, uh, curved than this is. Um, but that's just because if you look at 1920s dresses, that seems, this sort of curve seems to be the common situation. So what I did to achieve this, I marked that 11 inches down how far I want my armhole to go. I came in two and a half inches here on my shoulder. This is um, all to make a mock-up, by the way. So this is not the finish necessarily. This is just what I did to start with. And then I could, um, sort of uh, perfect from there while using a mock-up. I am going to be making a mock-up of this bodice today. It is what I recommend you do as well because you will see why. We're doing a combination of flat pattern drafting and draping today, but I'll get to that. So I came, I marked 11 inches here. I did go ahead and just straighten the line down for, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, like six inches down, just straight down. And then from there, I used my French curve to just curve it down from a six inches mark into my 11 inches down here. You don't have to have one of these. You can draw a curve yourself. Um, these are pretty inexpensive. And you can see I've had mine since my school days because it has my name on it. But um, it's really good for drawing in armhole curves especially. So that's how I got this line here. Um, will this be the line I finish up ultimately with? Who knows? We'll get to that in a minute. So that is where my shoulder line ended up on this guy. And this is the mark showing where I had sewn this whole area. This is where the sleeve extension was for the one hour. This is where I had sewn the front and the back together on the one hour. So this was my original neckline for the one hour dress. Um, so I am falling in the middle, kind of on the tip of the shoulder here, which is where I want to be. This kind of finish right here on the edge of the shoulder is where I want this to be. And that's hopefully what I've done here. Again, who can say when we're still in, uh, you know, just paper. So imagining that this is where my neckline began, I had this large wide open boat neckline on the one hour dress so I could pull it over my head, but I don't need that much space because I'll have all this to help get this on over my head. Um, I can come in a lot closer to the neck. So if you measure your neck, mine, for example, is around 14 inches at the base of my neck. Um, you definitely want to have, you know, this front, this neckline be at least big enough to go around your neck and also around your head. Um, so you want it to be big enough to go on over your head. Um, I took this 14 inches, I divided it by four, and I, well, I guess you can divide it by two, and make sure that that seven inches centered on the center front here, um, you have at least seven inches so that you can get your neck in here, basically. Um, and then I came out an additional half inch from there and then drew in a V neckline. This one I drew, I think this is 12 inches deep. Oh, I held up a measuring tape to myself. I held it up to next to my neck at my shoulder and then held it down to where I would like the neckline to be. So I kind of measured that. I'll show you perhaps on the mock-up I'm gonna show you in a minute. Um, so I knew that I wanted that kind of to be 12 inches and that translated to being, let's see, eight inches down. Oop, my ruler. 
and that translated to being let's see ten and a half from the like major major boat neckline up here that I would have had for a one hour for example so that V comes in here so that's just how I generally found this V um, who knows if I mock it up I might want this strap thinner to come the V come out wider I might come in closer I might have the V be a lot less deep or more deep this is just my starting point that I worked off of from um, we're making some decisions here on the flat pattern but we're gonna make final decisions on a mock-up today so a little bit different for me here on the channel but I'm already noticing this video is gonna be a lot longer than I thought it was gonna be I was hoping for a nice quick 20s video but clearly I'm not capable of that so what I've done here is I have added seam allowance along the drop waist seam along the side seams and along the shoulder seams um, I didn't cut the v-neck out because I want to cut one piece straight across for the back and then I'll cut the v-neck onto the front piece so eventually here I'm going to cut one with a V and one without, so I've just left it like this for now. You'll notice I have not added seam allowance along the armhole here. That is because for this particular dress that I'm going to be making today, I'm going to be making it out of a sheer lace, and I'm going to go ahead and bind the V-neck and the armholes and the hem even in rayon seam binding as the finish, as the edge, instead of having that seam, seam allowance here, you know, turned under and sewn to a facing or sewn to another layer or anything, I'm just going to go ahead and straight up bind the edge. So I want this to represent the finished edge as opposed to the finished edge plus seam allowance. So that's why I didn't add any onto this armhole here. I won't be adding on any to the V or the back neckline, but we'll get to that when I start cutting out the real fabric. For now, we're just still working on the mock-up pattern. So this is what I have as a starter. I've made this using measurements from the one hour dress pattern or just measurements, frankly. It's basically based off of the bust measurement in general. But now I need to figure out if this is gonna work. And this is where I was yesterday when I realized I'm going to, me personally, I'm going to need to dart. I don't think everyone will. I think if you have a smaller or a flatter bust shape, you may not need a dart. If you're using a fabric that has a lot of open give to it, perhaps, you may not need a dart because the fabric will mold the body so well on its own. Um, it's hard to know if that's going to be the case, though. I always err on the side of caution <laughs> when it comes to, like, hoping the fabric will just do something magical. So what I did at this point here because I wanted to test these things before I jumped on in, was I cut out a version of this pattern, a front and a back, in some spare polyester lining fabric. This has a good, like, mm, drapiness to it, because I'm going to be using a lace or a chiffon or a velvet or something else with a nice flowy drape if, every time I ever use this pattern. I wanted something that didn't have the stiffness of, like, a cotton muslin. Um, use what you have on hand, but if you're going to make a mock-up or a um, twall little version of anything, it's best to make it in as similar a, a fabric to your finished fabric that you have laying around. So this, if you cut it out in a stiff, thick, let's say cotton sateen or a twill or a stiffer muslin and you make it fit in that fabric, it may react differently when you then cut it out of your, like your nice silk. So it's best to use something that has a similar drape to what you will be using in the end. So I cut this out of a lovely taupe polyester lining I had sitting around. So you'll see here, I was able to cut the front um, of this V on in one piece, but I had to cut the back in two pieces. But that's fine, it just has a center back seam, but for the twall, no problem. So if I lay this on top of here, you can see, hopefully, that that is the same, only I have a dart pinned into this side, which I will get to. Um, but this is just this piece cut out, um, a front and a back, and I cut the V into the front, and then I sewed together at the shoulder seams, at the side seams, and of course I had to add a center back seam to this, just because my fabric I didn't have very much left. Um, normally you would cut that on the fold as well. And I thought, okay, cool, let me try this on and see where we get. And so I'm going to jump to footage of me wearing this. All right, I will level with you. It's not my most attractive look of all time. The lighting in this spot, not ideal. I don't have a lot of makeup on. But you know, this is serious sewing business. It's not about glamour right now, okay? So I have this little taupe, I mean, also very flattering color for me, version of that pattern we just drafted. We just drafted that flat pattern. This side is exactly what we just did. This side, I've been playing with it, obviously. So how do we get from here to here? That's what we're gonna be doing today. Normally we're doing all flat pattern drafting uh, on my channel. But because I don't have a block to work off for the 1920s, because the 1920s are weird, <laughs> I 
have to kind of do more draping on the form or on the body in this case. Now, is this better to do with a friend helping you or you helping a friend? Probably. But we're introverts here on this channel and you're doing it yourself, I'm doing it myself. Let's just be honest with everyone. So here is how, see here, how that fits right off of the paper. And we can see where our fit problems are. Um, we have this excess here. Now again, this when there's a sleeve here, all in one attached, this kind of falls and falls in with the draping of the sleeve and it just is fine that there's this excess around the bust. But when we have taken the sleeve off, suddenly we have this problem. Now, you don't want it to fit like this, let's be honest. And when you look at the 1920s images, they have no darts and yet somehow it fits seamlessly. Again, I think they have secret darts, some shoulder gathering, etc. Or they just have a smaller or flattened bust. But in this case, I don't, I have no way to have a smaller and I don't want to have a flattened bust, so we're going to add a bust dart instead. So, how are we going to do this? Normally when I'm doing my dart manipulation with my two dart bodice block for you all, I start by moving the darts around from the apex. Now, again, don't have an apex mark on this 20s pattern, so I have to find my apex. Now, the best way to do this is to just see where the center of your bust is and mark it with a pen. So that is what I have done here, and why I look so... I can't believe I'm going to put this on the internet. Okay, um, so I've marked the apex of me onto this pattern, basically. That's what I've done here. So now we have an apex, but we don't know how much dart fullness we're going to be directing towards and then manipulating from that apex point. Except for, you can kind of see how this weirdness, which also could be pinched into a dart down here, notice, um, you can put your darts wherever you want. And once we have one, we can then move it around. But um, you can see how this kind of falls into a dart quite naturally. Um, if you start just kind of pinching here, it falls, I'm sorry I'm looking at the uh, not the lens very much during this, by the way, I'm looking at the viewfinder to see if I'm explaining this okay. Um, but you can start to pinch out a dart. Now again, is this the best thing to be doing on yourself, fit-wise? No mates, but we're going to do it. Take some sewing pins, and we're just going to pinch out that dart and pinch it closed with a pin. So I've just pinned that little area closed. Um, so what You'll start to notice here too, is how this finishes here. If I was going to just bind this edge straight off of this, um, I've cut... This is one from the pattern. This one I've already trimmed down. Um, I've trimmed this so that it lays where I want it to finish. Over here, I have this like extra, like on my arm as opposed to on my like torso, I guess. Um, so I wanted to come in a little bit more on this shoulder and ease that out here. So that's one modification I'll make to this pattern. Adding the dart is, of course, another. Um, I think, actually, even though I have this pinned up here, I will actually probably swing this dart into the side, which is what the dart seem to be, on any 1920s examples I can find, if there is a dart, it seems to be in the side, so that's where I will be putting mine. Um, I will also show you how to put this dart into fullness at the shoulder, like all those secret hidden 1920s darts I've been examining for the past 48 hours. But that's how you pinch out a dart, and this immediately starts to fit better, as we can see. Um, enjoy these lily white arms. Um, so you can see here how this immediately starts to fit better because of that dart. And again, I'm pretty happy with how low the V is. It's quite low for me, but I'm going to have a straight across slip underneath here and I wouldn't mind a little triangle of that showing. Under the arm on this side, I have, I didn't lower this anymore here. I just trimmed off from the top to get to this. And I quite like the way this looks over here. It's high enough to still cover my bra strap, which is right down in here. Um, and then I'll have a slip on underneath this as well, which we'll be going over in a future video as well. But it'll be easier to draft that slip notes we know what our 1920s dart needs to look like. Look like. Um, but in general, you know, I'm not going to control any of this fullness. Now, you know, if we're making a bodice block and we're draping on a person or a form, and you wanted to make like a two dart bodice block, like I do for my 40s and 50s kind of things on this channel, um, you'll need. Usually, there's a bust dart of some kind. Usually, it's from the side. And then once you start to pinch out another dart here, you start to understand how you can create a fitted bodice from this. But of course we don't want a fully fitted bodice from this because it's supposed to be for the 20s. So we're leaving all this waist under bust fullness. And of course once you have the weight, because this has no skirt attached to it yet, pulling down on this a little bit more, it fits even a little bit better. Um, so the weight of the skirt will help this fit nicer as well. So that is how I found the bust dart 
principally how I first found what how much fullness I need to remove from this pattern that I just drafted with you and I will show you how to transfer the things we've done on here marking the apex and things like that onto that pattern paper and then you will go ahead and you know modify this try it on again until you get somewhere where you like what it looks like and then you can go ahead and you know use the pattern from there so hopefully this one's instructive if it's in black and white if there's a voiceover instead of me talking you'll know it's because I couldn't link the audio was too messed up to link with the video or whatever hopefully this worked um, I don't think we'll be doing this much in the future because it's just not good lighting over here in this corner of the sewing room but thank you for bearing with me okay now we have very pink sports bra engaged here which also seems to do some strange things to my shoulders I probably should take a little bit off this shoulder as well um, which is why they recommend you try these things on inside out <laughs> so that the seams are visible so you can pinch out a little bit let's say up here so that this is at a little bit of an angle here because most people don't have shoulders they're straight across funny enough so it probably should add a little bit of a taper here to this anyway so while we're here um but i have this on with a sports bra now which obviously is a little bit of a flatter silhouette but we noticed that with me i still need a dart taken out of this so even with a sports bra i think the dart would probably be a little bit smaller um so if that was how i was intending to wear this and it, kind of a more accurate 1920 silhouette, um, I would probably need a smaller dart, but I personally would still need some sort of way to control the extra fullness. Maybe if you try this uh, mock-up, like the one straight off the paper, try it on with the sports bra, and for you, maybe it'll work. This depends on your body shape, your proportions, things like that. Maybe you can get away with having a dartless 1920s time. However, I am just not one of those people. Also, while we're here, I should show you how, um, like if you were to take this dart and put it up into the shoulder, what happens? So, actually we'll remove this bit we just did um, so I can show you that. But like those secret darts I've been discovering in the 1920s where there is a pleat up here, you can already see how that starts to make this fit much better because you put a little pleat up in here, let's say, and that serves as a dart coming down to the bust and so this lays flat suddenly, whereas before it gapes. Also, if you were to put some gathering up here, the same sort of thing starts to happen. It starts to fit better down here along the arm as soon as you have put essentially this dart fullness, if you swing it up into here and take the dart out up here, it starts to fit smoother here as well. So, you know, that's just manipulation around the bust. Um, it's what we people have to deal with. People, people with busts have to deal with these sort of things. Um, so again, I'm going to put a little bit of probably just like less than a quarter of an inch, maybe an eighth of an inch incline here, uh, just so that fits my shoulders a little bit better. Actually, maybe that is a quarter of an inch. An eighth from each side, so a quarter to get all together. So an eighth from um, the front and the back. So I'll just take an eighth off the pattern. I guess we're using this pattern for the front and the back. Hopefully you're with me. Sometimes I always fear that I'm extremely confusing. And I think in my other 20s video, Quite frankly, I am. Um, so thank you all for putting up with me. But again, I still think, even with a sports bra, until I get like a 1920s super flattening situation, which I'm not really interested in. I only wear 20s on the rarely, kind of for special events even. I like wearing 1920s dresses um, to like long evening events where I might be sitting for a long time. It's just much more comfortable and yet still glam. Um, but I, even with a flattening situation, still need a dart here. And so you may as well. Um, but just to show you what this looks like. Um, but now I will go ahead and finish showing you how to transfer anything you've put onto your muslin onto your paper pattern. So, laying our friend back down on our pattern, we need to transfer the apex point and we need to um, transfer these dart points onto this pattern and then also just shave off, again, an eighth of an inch along here, but also shave off a lot of this along here as well. Um, so I will use this side that I already trimmed honestly as a guide uh, for me to make modifications to this pattern. I'm just going to, you know, I'll, I'll show you. <laughs> so if I turn the muslin inside out, we can still see our marker marks because they have no problem bleeding right through this fabric. And we line up, you know, where this would lie. I can go ahead and trace. I've already cut this. Um, while you're wearing this, go ahead and you can mark it or you can just look at the top of your shoulder and say, oh, I need to come in at least an inch. Come in an inch and then connect it down into the side. Um, what I did was I drew on, you can see there's some marker, 
I went ahead and drew onto this while I was wearing it, a little sketchy line where I wanted it to be, and I cut it off, tried it on again, saw how I liked it, and now I just have to transfer that change onto this pattern. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw, just trace along this cut edge up into this uh, shoulder so I know how far additionally I wanted to come in on the shoulder. Also, you see I did dip this down in the neck for a better fit in the back as well. So I will go ahead and just cut this back edge here. And again, that will be for the back pattern piece and I'll have to cut the V in the front still. But I'm gonna go ahead and transfer this new shoulder line in here, transfer in a dip in the back, and then I can start working on putting this dart on here. So you can go ahead and transfer this point onto the paper underneath. Sometimes an easy way to do that is to go ahead and pin through there and then you can go under here, find where that pin is, like that, and mark that on your pattern paper here. And then, of course, the same with the dart legs up here. You just kind of, it's hard to do while holding a phone, but you just transfer them from here onto the paper. And then we will have a dart, and I will show you how to, first of all, finish this dart. Second of all, move it either into fullness in the uh, up here, or into the side where it seems that 20s ones, if there is a dart, they go. Sometimes when you're doing something like this where you're taking notes from a muslin and transferring them back down to paper, you'll like draw it wrong the first time or you're sketching in a curve and you don't like the first curve you drew or whatever. Um, that's why it helps to be having different colors of pens because then you can know, oh, the blue one is the correct one or whatever. Um, but this here, I put the pencil line over where I want the actual tracing to be. And I put little hatches through the correct line. So I know to ignore this one down here, this like lighter version, because I put the hatches in that line. So I know that the, my final chosen line was that. Um, that's just another thing I do when doing things like this. I went ahead and marked the dip in the neckline. So I will go ahead and curve that there. And then again, I won't need to add any seam allowance to that because I'll be binding this edge instead. Um, that's just how I'm finishing mine. But also I put my dart in here. So I've marked that apex with that pin like I showed you marked the dart legs and then I just connected those. And so now I need to come out a, like if I were to leave this dart right where it is, I need to come out an inch and a quarter is what I usually use. Five eighths I think is the recommended, but again, you want it to be as least pointy as possible. So I almost think going a little bit larger is good in this case. So uh, I'm gonna mark a point out in the center of this triangle, an inch and a quarter here, and then I will reconnect the dart legs. So this is a proper dart. So if I were to keep the dart right where I pinched it out of the mock-up, I would keep it right here, right? And I would use this smaller version of it. Again, you never want your dart to come right to the apex unless you're trying to go for a pointy look. Um, so I've come out a little bit, but this dart should be all we need on this. Now, you know, if you're doing this <laughs> and you want to be precise, you should go ahead and transfer, like these marks should already be on your pattern because like we took them from this to put them on here. So go ahead and on here, draw the dart legs and pin them nicely. Again, you can see I've demarcated which dart is the one I favor with those little marks and go ahead and pinch that closed and pin along that with little pins nicely and then try this on again with it more precise you know I pinned this I pinched and pinned this out with one dart over here when we were doing it on my body but over here now that it's drawn in I can go ahead and nicely you can even sew this obviously over on the machine sew that dart in try this on again see if you like the fit of it see if there's still a little bit of excess there so you make your dart a tiny bit bigger if there's if it seems to be pinching too much make your dart a little bit smaller coming in a little bit um, you want to trial and error this situation that's why we have made this guy is to perfect this so that when you go and use this to perfect this and you use this to cut out your nice fabric it turns out how you want it to so um on this side i've already been playing with the darts already as i was last night and this side i'm just showing you how to do that so here we have our dart that we used from the muslin now the 1920s seems anytime there's a dart, again, it's swung down into here. So just like I would do any other time when I'm doing dart manipulation, I would go ahead and draw a line from where I want the dart to be, let's say there, out to my apex, slash up to the apex point, slash in from one of these dart legs to the apex point, and then swing this closed and open one up here. So I'll go ahead and do that now. So as of right now, our dart is in the arm side. Now we are going to open up into the waist seam instead. And this is a nice straight waist seam for this 20s dress. Um, so I'm just going to lift that up, go ahead and close the dart along the arm side, which opens it up into our waist instead. I'm going to go ahead and tape along here. And then this, you can see this line is now messed up. I'm just going to go ahead and come off from here and ease that spot away. And I'll just cut that excess off. So again, I've closed this dart. I've just eased this area into a curve again so that my shoulder or arm side is nice again. And then I've opened that up and filled in with paper here. 
Again, this is the apex, so I've come back a little bit. Um, again, I use one and a quarter. Use what you know is best. You must do what you feel is right, of course. Um, oh, wait. Um, and then you connect that point to your dart legs over here. And now the dart is in the side instead. And you can see we still get that space for the bust. And we start to close this. Now you could do this as gathering too if you wanted to. Um, but uh, we're gonna, I'm going to show you how to do it as gathering up here. So I'm actually, now that I've got this all in here, and um, you'll see me on my channel a lot of the time, I'll fold this closed and then I'll cut off this excess here to get the correct little diamond shape at the back end of the start. But I'm actually, now that I've shown you how to move the dart into the side, I'm actually going to close that back up again, open this <laughs> area back up again and swing that dart fullness up into this shoulder area so you could use it as gathering or in the other many ways that they have been doing it in the secret dart. So you could either close this dart up here, but not so along the dart. And so have like sort of a pleat up here, um, which seems to be what this kind of thing is. Or you could use this fullness as gathering up here along the shoulder to create those gathered shoulder secret dart 20 situations that I'm, I'm sure that there's bust fullness hiding in these design details now that I look at them. So to shift this dart fullness that we pinched out into the shoulder instead, I'm just drawing a line from the apex up to the kind of the center of the shoulder seam here. And then I will again cut along that to the point and close this guy again and open it up up here. So now that we have that slashed, again, close this dart right up again and it opens up here. Wow, what a big dart you're thinking, but we're not gonna use it probably as a dart if you're putting it up into the shoulder like this. There was that one image where it seemed that there had a shoulder dart. Again, you would come up that same inch and a quarter and draw your dart legs out to these points. But I think with something like this, you would just gather, like if you know this finished area is supposed to be four inches, you would gather this stuff in the middle until this was four inches again. You'd probably gather starting from like where this one is and where this is, and you would try and get all that into that one and a half inches of space basically um, to have the gathering coming down from the shoulder. So this version would in the end look like this basically. And of course, when you're making a 1920s dress, you're using a lighter weight fabric. Um, so like a chiffon, a really lightweight cotton, um, you know, just lighter, gauzier fabrics. So gathering that much into a small area won't be that big of a problem. All right. So I've been working on a full piece like I normally do when I do a one hour, uh, because normally I cut my one hour dresses out of one large sheet and don't have a waist seam and all kinds of things. So I usually cut them in one piece and I want to have them in one piece so that I can see how much fabric I need. But I don't actually need this pattern to be like this because of course this front and back will be laid along the fold of the fabric. And essentially on here, this is the modifications I've been doing with you today. These are the modifications that I had decided upon last night. So on this mock-up, like you saw, I had some darts drawn in and stuff from earlier work. So those are the, my final choices that I wanted to make and I wanted to leave this side free to show you how I got to here today. Um, but they might not be exact. So I'm gonna go with these modifications because those are the ones. I had decided upon last night. So I actually have cut my pattern in half here and I've done my modifications that I'm going to use for this particular dress over here instead of just using this one that I've been showing you different things with. <laughs> Goodbye. So over here, I did that same dart into the armhole and now it's starting to get a little bit more of an acute angle, which I think is funny or like an acute um, because it's starting to look more like my normal bodice block does. And this bodice block of mine has a full bust adjustment done to it. That's kind of why my armhole looks like that. So it doesn't surprise me that in the end, once I've added a dart big enough for me, that this armhole starts to look more and more like this one because that's what a full bust does to a pattern, I suppose. Um, but I've swung it closed and opened it up into the side seam. You can see this is a rather large dart. Now, like the delineator from 1927, I would actually recommend breaking this up into two darts. So um, when you're closing this one, draw one line out and then draw another one and then split this fullness between the two to have two darts here. Um, because my fabric I'm using for this is going to be a little bit annoying to work with, I'm going to keep it as one so I only have to sew one dart in this kind of annoying lace fabric I'm using for this dress. So if you're using a smoother fabric, a silk, a velvet, something that isn't have bulkiness of lace, uh, I think you should be fine to have two darts here instead. I think it'll give a nicer finish, but I'm gonna keep one dart just because I'm gonna be lazy and don't wanna sew two in the fabric I'm using for this. So that's my bodice pattern for this 1920s dress finished. I'll just go ahead and like fold this or cut the V 
for the front piece when I cutting this out. This is going to be my fabric for this dress also. Um, this is actually not a stretch lace, although it kind of looks like one. Um, this is a cotton nylon blend lace from Mood, or at least they say it's a cotton blend. I, it doesn't feel like cotton to me, um, but that's what they said. A burn test kind of melts and doesn't react like cotton would. I don't know. I've never had Mood lie to me before, so I assume this is a blend uh, like they say it is, but it is a little strange. Um, up close, uh, this is the backside actually. It is quite pretty. It's got, you know, re-embroidered or like um, cording going on, on the top here. Now, some of you Ravenclaw devotees may say that is navy and gold, not bronze, but I'll say to you, bronze is a hard color to find, and so we're going to go with this. Uh, sorry, not sorry. It is quite pretty though, huh? So I'm going to use this to make this dress. However, we still have to figure out what we're doing for the skirt, right? So I'm going to cut out a square like this. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and cut out just a square like this with no seams. And I'll just cut a slit actually in the center of it and then attach that onto this bodice. Um, some fabrics, something like this where it's like a loosey goosey weave, you can kind of get around having to, or being able to do that. You can, you can probably get away with it. If you have something like a tighter weave, like plain weave, let's say, uh, let me see, what would it not work with? Maybe even a satin. You probably couldn't get away with this because of seam allowance needed uh, in a different way. So I would recommend putting a seam through your skirt um, along the side seams or the center front. Um, you could design that into the pattern, like if you wanted there to be a seam down the center front or if you wanted there to be side seams, um, which you would see less with something like this. You would incor could incorporate that in design, but something like this, I think I can fudge it but, and not have seam allowance around this area here. Um, it'll just get eaten out of the gar or, uh, fabric. Um, so hopefully that kind of makes sense. Hopefully you'll see it when I'm sewing what I mean. There might be a little bit of tiny bit of tucking, uh, around where there isn't seam allowance in the square, but that will be really easy to hide in this lace basically. Um, so I'm not going to bother putting seam allowance in my skirt pattern and for my skirt pattern, as it were, I'm basically, basically just going to cut out a big square out of this. Now, how large your square is, is how long your skirt will be. So if we imagine my bodice being attached here, let me see if I can grab a pencil, it's going to get sewn on to this bit, right? The front and the back. Um, how long this hangs down here in the front is how long I want my skirt to be. So for me, it's going to be 25 inches because that is how long I made my one hour dress. Um, from the drop waist down to the hem, 25 inches is what I prefer. So again on, well even I'll use this to show you, for if I was adding a waist seam, which I am, um, I would want this to be 25 inches and this, which is going to hang down along here eventually, and it'll look like this. I kind of also want to be like maybe at least 20 inches, so I want, um, I want my like rectangle on each the front and the back to be quite large. So let me figure out exactly what I want to do and then I'll explain to you my reasoning after I've worked through my reasoning. All right, so for the skirt on this one, my square skirt that I'll be sticking this guy onto, my fabric here, the blue lace, is actually um, 59 inches wide. Um, and probably a little bit less than like maybe an inch less because the salvages are like weird stuff on the edge <laughs> that I'll be cutting off. Um, so it's about 59 inches wide. I think I'm going to keep the width of the fabric and cut it into a rectangle that is um, like 24 inches long from the drop waist. Um, so that's 24 on the front, 24 for the back for 48 inches. So the rectangle itself will be the width of the fabric, which is 59 inches by 48 inches and then I will cut a slit in the center and that is where I will stick the bodice onto this. Um, again, if you have a fabric that isn't a loose weave like this, you're going to have to put a seam in here maybe. You can probably get away with not having to do it on most things, but sometimes you're going to have to add a seam for perfect cleanliness if that's what you want um, with no puckering around putting this in here. Of course, you can also cut a circle 
and that will allow this to drape in a different way instead of it being quite if you cut this in a straight line this will be quite straight here in the front if you cut it in a circle it will um if you cut the hole out of the middle of this piece as a circle this will drape a little bit more like a circle skirt would and have a little bit more flow in this like front and back area if you cut it straight as like a line instead of a circle the drape will remain quite straight in the front and back uh, i'm just going to cut mine as a slit because i want that kind of graphic more straight front just because the 20s are a rather geometric time um, although a lot of times they were cut with a circle skirt on 20s dresses but because it's a really flowy fabric they don't stick out like a 1950s circle skirt would they flow against the body or behind you as you walk um, because of the textile chosen basically so if you cut a circle skirt in cotton sateen it's gonna look 50s you cut one in chiffon you can use it for 20s things no problem so again yeah basically this is a circle skirt it's just a square skirt instead so my rectangle that i will use i'm going to use the width of the fabric in uh, two sections basically but cutting it all in one so I'll have one big rectangle that's 59 the width of my fabric by 48 inches and I'm going to go over to the mannequin and show you what this looks like um, like as a preview of what this will look like here we are in the messy sewing room as usual but if I take Donna here and I pin my fabric onto her you can start to see what this will look like so this front hangs because it's straight across here instead of a circle it's straight across there that's where that bodice is going to be sewn into it this hangs quite straight here and then it handkerchiefs along the side and because this is such a wide fabric and large rectangle the points of my handkerchiefs will almost hit the floor here this is actually pinned so that this is about 26 inches long I'm going to cut it at about 24 just because my one hour dress pattern is a 25 inch kind of skirt section but that's in thinking about having a hem and this is not going to have a hem again it's going to have round seam binding around the edges so um i don't need that hem allowance basically the same way i would if i were doing a normal hem so i'm just going to be binding that at bottom edge and therefore i do not need it and i will cut this at 24 and then the sides will be about like the longest of the straight portions will be like 18 from the drop waist down and then it hangs in these little handkerchiefy bits so um you can just get an idea of what that looks like just with playing with the fabric here this is just pinned on here i haven't started cutting anything out yet the nice thing about doing a square skirt like this with a handkerchief hem is that you have straight edges to hem which is really nice because if you're not used to hemming circular edges it can be kind of a pain but hemming a straight edge is easy peasy and nice so that's kind of a perk of this guy these go together quite quickly but it takes a while to explain unfortunately i believe i just mentioned cutting this big guy apart um and going ahead with this one, with my modifications as my front, I did just go ahead and trim off this for to keep my V-neckline, and I'll use this as my front pattern. I'm actually gonna use this side to make the back pattern here. Um, so I'm gonna keep this curve up here at the top, um, but this n arm edge is gonna stay as it was. Uh, I modified this top edge, of course, but it's gonna stay otherwise the same. I'm not adding the dart into here, I'm just keeping it flat, because that's how it was when we did this mock-up, if you'll recall. We change things on the front. I added a dart and played with this a little bit, but the back, I didn't need to change anything. So the back is staying the same. So I'm going to use this half, um, everything taped back together, no longer Frankenstein to be able to show you stuff. So this is just the same as it was when this was all one big 22 by 22.5 rectangle or whatever. Um, so I'll use this as my back. This is my front. I'll go ahead and label those now. Um, I just got almost halfway through actually cutting this out and before I realized that I couldn't use this for the front and the back <laughs> I'm so used to using the one hour dress pattern where the front and the back are the same that I was like do do do, do. I'll use this to cut the front and the b uh, no they're different now this front has a bust start and the back doesn't need one I don't want to say I'm a little sleep deprived you guys but I might be a little sleep deprived but in any case you'll remember we drafted this all as one from that one hour dress I just sliced them apart. This is the side I was showing you stuff on, but I just taped it all back together to keep it flat, just like when I made this mock-up with it, when the front and the back were identical. Oh God. <laughs> and so I'm gonna keep the back the same as it was, and I'm going to use the front with the dart. Hopefully that makes sense. I can't believe I just like, I was losing my mind, unfortunately. Uh, but clearly I need a rest, so I better get going on this so I can get to bed tonight because goodness.
So this is how I cut the skirt out, by the way. So this is the full width of my fabric, that 59 inches. Um, and I laid it all out. I chose which side Mood had cut straighter for me and then folded that back up on itself. So there's a fold along this edge and at 24 inches. So therefore all total 48 by the 59. And I will cut a slit in the center of this 22.5 for my bodice to go in there or 22.5 and an inch for some sleeve allowance. So laying out here, I still have this piece still sitting here. This is the cut edge here. That's the folded edge up here. I've just laid the bodice piece where it's gonna to need to go. This is like 60 inches wide, actually. It's kind of a little bit wider than they said it was. So at 30 inches, I've laid my pattern piece. And I'm gonna put two pins there, flip this, and put two pins where they need to be on the other side. And then I'll know where I need to put that slash through this big piece to attach the bodice on. So I've just pinned on this side here. So I'm just using the center front of the pattern here, lining that up with 30 inches on my measuring tape here. Put pins there, and then I just flip this, and again, lining it up with 30 and pins there. And that's all I know to put a slash along here to attach the bodice when I'm sewing this. All right, here I am with my rest of my fabric for cutting out the bodice laid on the blue patterning table again. Um, I'm just pinning this lace so that I can be sure that I have a straight line of this lattice kind of sort of pattern of this lace down the center front of my dress here. And then I'm pinning the bodice along the center front of the pattern just here along that fold. And I can cut this one out. I'm just using the leftover pieces of fabric from already having cut out that big 48 by 60 skirt there out on the floor where it's easier to cut huge pieces out. Um, just while I'm cutting this out, I should note that this dress goes together quite quickly and very easily if you are not making it out of a fussy fabric like I am about to do. Um, the way I chose to finish my edges with rayon seam binding, or with binding in general, and the fact that this is lace um, added on a lot of work that you wouldn't otherwise have to do. So for example here, to mark my darts on this lace, I'm not going to be able to use Taylor's chalk and draw the dart legs right onto the fabric like I normally would. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking a piece of like delicate tissue paper and I'm going to draw the angle for my dart legs onto this paper to use as a template underneath this lace in order to sew basting stitches onto the lace as my markings for my darts. So here I am using a pink marker on the tissue paper to draw my darts and then I will use, I will have one um, side for the right hand side of my dress front and one for the left of course. And what I've done is I've taken my pattern and I've used it to mark with pins the dart legs and the end of the dart on the lace and then I'm matching that up with the pink marker on this tissue paper and I will actually sew using the markings of the tissue paper to show through the lace as I sew I will go ahead and use large basting stitches stitch through the fabric and through the paper using that paper marking as a guide to where my darts need to be. This is all because I can't mark the piece with chalk, basically. Uh, I'm using the tissue paper instead as an indicator of where I should baste as my lines for my darts. Hopefully this will make sense as you watch me do it. I lost my dart point here, so I'm just laying my pattern back down on this side so I can pin the end of my dart. So I'm just putting a pin there and then I'm lining that up with the tissue paper version of the dart so that I can see that pink marker line through the lace and use that as the indication of where my dart legs need to be because I can't draw on this lace, of course, it's quite textured. So I'm gonna take this over to the machine and I'm going to use pink thread in a large stitch length to transfer the pink markings from the marker on the tissue paper onto my fabric, basically. So you'll see me do that. Here I am at the machine, I'm just I've loaded it with pink thread and I'm going to trace the line on the tissue paper with stitches. And I will leave the needle down inside the dart point here. And then I will pivot all the way around so I can sew the other side of the dart. You can see there's pink lines on my fabric now. I'm stitching right through this tissue paper. It's got no problem. Your machine should stitch right through. I'm just dropping pins everywhere. Just stitching right through into the paper using paper as a guide, but now of course I will have these pink stitches as a guide. So you do that for both sides, take that back over to the table, and you can tear off the paper. So I'm just tearing that off from the stitches now that it has served its purpose. 
and you can see instead of being able to draw my darts with chalk I have drawn them with thread so this pink stitching will be removed later but instead of being able to mark my darts like I normally would this is how I had to mark my darts for this project again sewing this dress is so much easier if you're doing it in say I don't know a solid colored silk <laughs> or something that isn't as crazy and textured as this lace so now I am able since my darts are finally marked to go ahead and pin my darts Again, you now understand why I only wanted to do one dart on each side instead of splitting it into the two as suggested by Delineator or whatever. So I'm just pinning my darts closed, lining up those pink stitching lines. And then after I sew this dart, I will be able to remove the pink stitching, of course. And over here, I'm just going to sew this dart as I normally would now, setting with navy blue thread and a small stitch length now. And I don't worry about sewing over the pink or anything, I'll just take my time to remove the pink threads afterwards but I am also taking my time to sew the start, as we can see here. I think I have this in real time. And I'm removing my pins as I go. So unlike me, we all know how I sew over my pins on this channel. Ah, looks like I sewed over at least one there. It's just what I do, especially when I'm taking my time like this, it's really unlikely to hit a pin. Usually the only time I ever hit a pin is if I'm sewing really quickly, which is also the reason I don't remove pins is because I tend to sew very quickly. So I'll just remove that at the point and then I will tie off my dart end as usual, and I will do the same for the other dart on the other side. So a little bit of an extra step there for marking my darts with this fabric. Fabric? Fabric? Did I say fabric or fabric? Losing my brain. Then I'm going to go ahead and remove those pink basting stitches. Um, I have it sped up here, but I am being careful not to, you know, rip anything in this lace and be just carefully remove, go through wherever they're stuck and remove the basting that was there to indicate where the dart needed to be, basically, because now the darts are sewn in. I don't need that pink stitching any longer. Much more annoying than removing, you know, brushing away some Taylor's chalk marks, but alas, it wouldn't have worked on this lace. There are even fancier ways to sew darts in lace, by the way. I'm going to put a link to a blog post where I learned how to do that thread trick I just did for you. But also in that blog post, they show how to do darts in lace in a much finer, more couture fashion, which I did not bother to do this time. But here I am going to go ahead and sew my side seams together. I'm laying the back onto the front now. And I will sew the side seam here and then also the shoulder seams. Shoulder, shoulder seams. It's kind of hard to say shoulder seams five times fast. Don't try it. I'm just going to make sure that I'll be able to bind that as well. Got my rayon seam binding sitting here because that's what I'm going to be using on all the edges for this dress. But I will go ahead and pin the shoulder seam as well. Here we go. I did do one side at a time here. So here I am sewing that shoulder seam shut. Half inch seam allowances as usual on this and then the side seam as well, sewing over my pins. Yes, it's wrong, and yes, I do it. Do as I say, not as I do, you know? One of those. I should note that I, I've had an offer <clears throat> from my family to buy me a new sewing machine so do leave your recommendations for your favorite sewing machine in the comments below. I'm not exactly sure what I want to get, but I should take take my uh, my dad up on that offer. He offered to buy me a new sewing machine, mostly because this one makes a very high-pitched sound when winding a bobbin, so I think people who live with me have noticed that maybe it's on its last legs. <laughs> but I don't know if I should get a Bernina or what I should do, so let me know what your favorite sewing machine is in the comments below. Here I am just trimming my seam allowance so it's perfectly straight across and I'm going to use rayon seam binding. You just saw me ironing this in half so that I have a little like ditch or a little um, way to cup the edge and fold it inside this rayon seam binding. And I am just putting the whole seam allowance both sides together inside of here instead of um, binding each side of the seam allowance I'm just binding them together and I will press this towards the back that's just how I chose to do this on this particular dress. Especially because I was running low on this color of navy seam binding, so I wouldn't have had enough to finish this project the way I wanted to if I had bound each seam side of the seam individually. So just pinned that with little finer glass head pins you'll notice I'm using on this. Brought that back over to the machine, and I'm just using 
my machine to stitch the edge of that seam binding down over my raw edges so that all the raw edges of this lace are contained within rayon seam binding. Like so, all along the side seam there. And then I did the same for the shoulder seams, as you can see here, these little short seams up on the shoulder, and I am just pressing that seam allowance down on the back side of the dress. And then I can go ahead, trim off the excess little bit at the end there, and I will go ahead and bind the raw neckline edge. Again, I was being careful when doing this pattern not to add seam allowance in any areas and to like think ahead that this area was just like whatever the cut edge was going to be was going to be the finished edge because I was simply going to bind it like this. So I didn't add seam allowance or I took seam allowance away in some instances because I wanted the cut raw edge of this neckline and armhole situation to be the finished edge because I knew I was going to just be binding it in this way. So I sewed that on there or on the machine and then here I am just pressing that so it lays a little nicer. And then I will do the same to these, the arm side or the arm opening here, binding that edge. Okay, I just spent a rather fun amount of time binding all the run, uh, binding all the raw edges of my bodice with rayon seam binding. I do think it looks nice. Um, of course, something like this bound in a silk binding or a um, like a silk bias would be even prettier perhaps, but perhaps even more annoying than this was. Um, the nice thing about rayon seam binding is it's all finished on its own. So um, that's what this looks like coming off the card. This is Hug Snug Rayon Seam Binding. It just happened to match quite well. The tone of um, navy matches quite well. It's even better in person on camera. It's a little bit different, um, but this is just all machine stitched bound all the way around. I also went ahead and whoop, bound the seams on the inside. I didn't do them individually, so it's just everything's pressed to the back and bound in that way. Um, but I trimmed the seam allowances a tiny bit and then just bound them, I mean, not even flawlessly, we can see, um, but it will work um, in round seam binding on the shoulder there. And then also did the same along the side seams as well. So there's no raw edges inside. So the bodice is all finished and ready to go. But now I'm gonna to have to attach it to my big, huge 48 by 59 skirt piece. But before I do that, I have to cut the slit in the center of this. So again, if you wanted to like take your circle skirt pattern or make a circle skirt pattern um, and, or like use your waist, let's say you have 30 inch waist, the diameter of that circle, whatever that would be, you could use that and cut out a circle here. Um, but again, I'm just gonna cut a straight slit. So I had marked that with two pins and there's three pins over here. Um, while this was still laying flat on the floor, while it was nice and flat and cutting it out. I've just pinned this so that um, if you see these little, you can't really tell here, but these gold dots are on some sort of a grid. So I've just pinned this so that it's straight and all along the grid. And I am just gonna go ahead and take my scissors and put a slit from those pins to these pins. And then I can sew my bodice to my skirt. So here I am cutting open that slit in the middle of my big square. Again, you may actually have to sew two rectangles together if your fabric won't allow you to do it this way. Um, this has enough movement and ease inherent in the you know, loose lace weave that I can do it this way. So I've laid the bodice on top of this, right sides together. I'm matching the side seams up to the ends of the slit, and then I'm pinning along the lengths here. Now, when I was working with this, I couldn't tell how pronounced the lattice or like uh, diamond print of the fabric really was, so I didn't bother to match up the diamonds along <laughs> the waist seam uh, of either the front or the back. If I had, you know, taken a step back and noticed just how prominent this gold patterning was, I probably would have bothered to match it up. But alas, I did not. And so now I'm just pinning the back side of the bodice to the back side of that slit I just cut into that big square, using lots of pins here, as is usual for me in general. Okay, back over on the machine, I can go ahead and sew the bodice to this uh, slit in the skirt here, just going all the way around with my usual half inch seam allowance. Again, I'm making sure that the seam allowance that I have bound along the side seams is pointing towards the back side of the dress here because I did not iron it open, I ironed it towards the back closed. All right, 
Now I'm going to use that same rayon seam binding and iron it in half again and bind that waist seam I just sewed. So that's next for me. Lots of binding, lots of fiddly, slippy rayon binding and very fun lace. And here I am actually doing the last step for this dress and that is to hem that skirt. Now again, the skirt is a big rectangle, so it's four straight sides. So it's very easy to just turn up the skirt, you know, a quarter of an inch twice and sew it. Um, here I am again, just using the seam binding on all those raw edges around the edge of the skirt, the bottom edge of the skirt, the hem, uh, just to keep consistency so that all the edges are finished in the same way on this dress. And so I did the seam binding on that waist seam we just sewed. And now my last step is to put seam binding on all the long, straight edges of the square skirt. And then this dress will be finished. But of course it took me a lot longer than it should because I used lace and fiddly rayon seam binding when of course you could just regular hem it and then use facings or a lining in the top of this dress and not have to do so much binding work like I did. And here is the finished navy and gold lace handkerchief hem 1920s dress. Um, I was really worried when I first tried this on. I was like kind of in the thick of having just finished working with this, you know, lace fabric, which is a bit fiddly and doing all that binding. And it was late at night when I first tried this on when I finished it. And I was like, do I actually not even like the result? Do I, is this like just too unflattering? And, uh, and then I slept on it, <laughs> made the slip the next day. And then when I finally tried this dress on with like the slip underneath and like accessorized with hair and makeup. I was like, oh, actually, I really quite like this dress. So I was glad in the end that I ended up liking it. Just goes to show, show that sometimes you need to like sleep on it when you've been too close to a project and you've been like pricking yourself with needles and pins and frustrated all day that sometimes it's best to like rest and then come back and you might like it more with a little bit of time. I hope this video was helpful for those of you who are interested in making a dress kind of like this one or in just in 1920s dressmaking in general. If you have any questions or need any clarifications on anything that I failed to explain properly in this video, just ask away in the comments below and I will try to answer to the best of my ability as usual. And if you want to see any other specific 1920s or like any designs really from any era, let me know in the comments what you're looking to see how to make and then hopefully I can add it on to my schedule in the future. And of course, thank you as always for joining me here in the sewing room today. I'll see you again soon. Bye.